Welcome here today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to Emmett Hall, the family of Michael Mallon. A quick few words about the house. The house dates from uh, 1911. It was first a butcher's shop. It was bought in February 1913 by James Larkin when it was converted into a trade union hall uh, managed by William Partridge, who was an important figure in the 1913 lockout and subsequently fought in the College of Surgeons in 1916. I'm the granddaughter of Michael Mallon. My name is Una, called after his wife, Agnes. I'm not going to give you a history of Michael Mallon's life, but I'm going to tell you what brought him here to Emmett Hall. Um, this hall was bought by James Larkin in, in 1912. Um, he had set up the, he wanted to have a branch, an Inchicore branch of the ITT, ITTGWU. Uh, which he um, had formed in 1908. So he appointed William Partridge as manager. Now William Partridge was a councillor and he was also very much involved uh, during the, um, the, the lockout. He was also instrumental in um, the cultural events of, of setting up cultural events here in Emmett Hall. And you can see from the picture over there, uh, they were in the form of Cayleys and songs and and um, d dancing. And they were held, there's a big back garden out here, and they had a platform and all these events were held out there. In 1915, it was 1915, William Partridge had to go around the country uh, to, uh, to the other branches of the ITTWU, but he needed somebody in his place. So Michael Mallon was appointed as uh, manager of Emmett Hall. And I think that um, it was William Partridge who suggested that Michael Mallon might uh, be here because he thought him, and I quote here just, um, as being one of the finest kindly hearted and clear minded men it has ever been my good fortune to meet. And he also used those words when he was asked to be godfather to, his, uh, to Michael Mallon's daughter who was born the August after her father was executed. Now Michael Mallon was a silk weaver by trade and but he was also and he had been in the British Army for 12 years. He was a professional mu musician and played several instruments especially the flute but he was also well known for conducting bands particularly fife and drum bands now at that time there was a fife and drum, the Inchicore Fife and Drum Band used to practice here twice a week. And when Michael Mallon um, was asked to be conductor of that band, he was only delighted because beside here there is a, um, an apartment and the family was able to move into that apartment in 1915. It was in 1914, the Mallon family moved into the upper floors of Emmett Hall. It was from this house that the four young children were roused from their beds to be brought to Kilmainham Jail to say goodbye to their father the night before he was executed. Now, it was one of the many apartments they lived in. They were a bit like nomads, actually, because they lived all over the place. And everywhere they went, um, Michael established, uh, established music and people came to his house for violin lessons and and um, that he also had bands around the country. When he became manager here, he was able to, uh, he continued conducting the fife and drum band here, and he became very well known. He was also highly respected. But at that particular time, he also became interested in the ITTWU, and also formed a branch of the ICA. And uh, from then on, unfortunately, music was beginning to be a bit sidelined, much to his regret. Uh, next to his family, as I said before, music was the love of his life. But because of his involvement, and he, when, before he came here, actually I should have mentioned, he was aware of the events that were going on here in the hall because he used to come over here to conduct the, uh, conduct the, uh, the band. So he was somehow he was aware of what was going on. But he at that time then became interested in the, well, involved in the ICA. And, um, 
James Connolly knew that he had been in the British Army and he thought he was the right man for the job. So um, he got his troops and he did a tremendous amount of drilling and practice and a lot of it was in the back garden here. His troops, <laughs> had, they did some target practicing out in the back. Behind here, as Michael said, is Richmond Barracks. And um, Michael was quite adept at acquiring rifles and ammunition. Uh, and I'm sure James Connolly knew this. So uh, Richmond Barrack being behind here, Michael uh, was able to acquire, uh, acquire rifles from, f from friendly <laughs> soldiers in the barracks. And he used to climb the wall and, and get them. Um, now, they couldn't stay in the house for very long because the house was raided on several occasions. Now, one particular day, um, James O'Shea, who was also the ICA, came over to the hall at the request of Michael Mallon and couldn't find him. So um, his young son, Seamus, said, oh, he's out in the back garden. So Shame, James was delighted, but when he didn't come back in, he went out to see where he was, and he saw two fellows scarpering over the back wall, and, he fe and James fell over something. It happened to be Michael Mallon, who had been clobbered on the head and was rendered unconscious. <laughs> Michael himself wasn't living in this house for very long, because um, in 1916, at the time of the Rising, he was, uh, he was chief of staff, and he was commandant over in Stevens Green and Partridge and Countess Markovich were with him. And at the, um, after, to, after the Rising, he was arrested. They were all arrested, but uh, he was arrested and brought here to Richmond Barracks. And from there, he was brought to Kilmainham Jail. But unfortunately, when he was passing, he had to pass this house on his way to Kilmainham Jail. And he stopped looked up at this house hoping to see a member of the family but unfortunately none of them were there he didn't but all he saw was his little dog Prinny so he, <laughs> yes. he was really sad about that and then he was brought to Kilmainham jail and he was court-martialed of course in Richmond barracks brought to Kilmainham jail and he was executed on the 8th of May actually I should have mentioned too that Con Colbert I think some of his relations are here yeah. he was also involved here with the volunteers so he used to come over to do some drilling as well um, and he too was, he was executed on the same day as Michael Mallon. His family continued to live in this house, not from 19, 1929, Michael, actually. Yeah, no, it was 1924, I think. It was earlier, yes. And then uh, they went to, um, to Mount, they moved then to Mount Brown. When <clears throat> my, my father was the eldest of the family. You can see him here in the picture. This, this one here is, is, my, is my father. He was only 12 years of age. Around up to 1930, this place then was used as a cultural centre after the Rising. And there were a lot of things going on. And one of the things actually was they showed films here. But what is interesting is that my father, my grandfather, opened a cinema on the corner of Jervis Street and Mary Street. But was one of the financial, it was a financial disaster, as were all the things that he put his hand to. He lost an awful lot of money on everything he did. <laughs> and so it was rather ironic that they showed films here. It wasn't easy for um, Agnes Mallon either because the house still continued to be raided even after her husband was executed. And so it was, she had a fairly tough life trying to bring up the children, but did a great job of it. Um, the Inchicore Heritage Group uh, had two plaques erected, um, for one for Michael Mallon and um, William Partridge, showing what uh, they were as members of the ITTWU, and I think it was certainly, it was certainly um, very timely. Joseph O'Brien is going to speak to us briefly. He is the, he's, I think he's 83, if, he, if, he be, if he's not too embarrassed for me to tell you his age, but he, uh, he wrote uh, uh, Inchicore Kilmainham District. It took him 40 years, but he, he got everything into it in terms of the social history of the area and the political history of the area. He's going to say a few words to you now. Uh, there's one local person who uh, had a, a deciding influence on the affairs of uh, this hall and this district. And this was a local man called Pat, Patrick O'Carroll, Patrick O'Carroll, who was in business as a coal merchant. Uh, right up beside the Black Line. Uh, the premises is nowadays occupied by um, Bowles, the chemist shop. He, he played a, a leading part in uh, 
the affairs of this hall and this district. I think he was born in James Street, but uh, his call to fame uh, regards uh, 1913 on the day of the uh, the, the infamous uh, baton charge in O'Connell Street. Uh, that what finished up out here. It's not so well known. It's known to some degree, but uh, it finished up, you might say, on that. Was it a Saturday or a Sunday? I can't remember. At the end of August 1913, and uh, uh, there was a, an incident outside the place here where, again, uh, the crowd uh, were uh, the crowd outside uh, in support of the strike, the strikers or the people who were locked out in O'Connell Street that day. Uh, they held a meeting outside in support of what was happening in O'Connell Street, and they were attacked here by the, the by the police, by the DMP, in a further attack on the actual hall here. And Old Cardle received a very severe wound to the head from one of the police, and he died. He, he was a member of the recently formed uh, Irish Volunteers. He had several groups using this hall. One was, of course, the uh, Irish Citizen Army, or Connolly's group, and then you had the Irish Volunteers. O'Carroll was belonging to the Irish, uh, the Irish Volunteers, and he suffered a fairly severe wound that day. I'm hoping that his name won't be allowed to fade in the district either, and that in some way his, uh, he actually has uh, relatives in the area. Thank you, first of all, uh, Michael, and uh, all of you involved with the uh, the uh, Kilmainham and Inchicore Heritage Group for the invitation to uh, take part in this opening of this wonderful exhibition. Uh, aside, perhaps, from the area of the GPO, this part of the city really has the most significant concentration of historic sites of importance in relation to under understanding 1916. And I think that's very important to acknowledge and understand as we uh, assemble here at this very important historic site as well. But you can have a look at what it looked like here three years ago when we had the exhibition. But I have managed to open the hall of the house, which is a quite nice hall and is very suitable for photographs. And for people who have travelled all the way to see Michael Mallon's family home, you can actually step into the hall there and have a photograph taken in the hall. It's felt everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.